Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 241. It is May of 2020. And in today's episode, I've got 10 strategies for you to find school records. You know, I was thinking about school because a lot of kids are now not in physical school. They are at home doing virtual school and things have really changed. But school has been around a long time and it certainly has generated a lot of records that can help the genealogist. So we will be digging into 10 strategies to help you find those records. Also in the mailbox, I heard from Tim and he had a question that I get asked quite often. And it's around this idea that as we're doing our genealogical work, we oftentimes end up finding items that go with other families, right? And if you like to go antiquing like I do, sometimes you'll see a photograph in an antique store and it's got a name written on the back and you just think, oh, I know that item wants to make its way back to its family and I want to help. Well, there are ways to help. And in the mailbox segment, I've got some answers for Tim and an interview with somebody who is really making this happen in a very tangible way, getting family items back to their families. But first, I wanted to share with you a tip that I gave in episode seven of Elevens is with Lisa. Now that's my brand new YouTube live show. You can watch it live on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central. And if that doesn't fit quite into your schedule, you can always watch the video replay. So we have all of the video episodes on our Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. And of course, at genealogygems.com, I have show notes. There's a um, article for each episode that includes the video as well as all of the notes. Well, in episode seven, I shared with you a change that Google kind of slipped into the Google search results. And since we're using Google on a regular basis, to find information to help us on our genealogy research. I think it's an important thing for us to recognize this change, know what it means, and how to work with it. So what happened was they put out a blog post that said that they have a new message. And this is coming up in search results. And as you know, I've written a book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. It's all about using Google for genealogy. So I keep my eyes peeled for these kinds of changes, just to kind of make us aware, you know, it's really easy to take them at face value and kind of miss the more important nuances of them when it comes to our own research. I ran a search about a musical group that my husband's grandfather was part of. It was called the Centennial Syncopators. I didn't spell it really well. (laughs) I was in kind of a hurry. But you know, sometimes once we've typed in our search, we don't actually look at what it was that we did. We just look at the results. And now you're getting this message. It looks like there aren't any great matches for your search. Please take it with a grain of salt. Okay, they're trying to be helpful. They're trying to alert you that initially whatever's showing up on this homepage is probably not going to meet your needs. But that's a signal to take a few extra seconds to look more closely at this search results page. I guarantee you 98%, it's not that there is nothing on the web about what you're looking for in your genealogy research. What it is, is that we need to make a change in what you're doing in terms of your search query. So one of the first little clues that they gave us above this big new notification is, did you mean, and it put the correct spelling, So yes, I did mean that. So that's a good hint. Oh, I misspelled it. Uh, Secondly, you can look kind of down and they'll give you some suggestions, but they're right now they're not all that helpful. They're not very specific to what it was you were looking for. And uh, and then it also gives suggestions. Hey, do you want to look for the definition of syncopators? Do you want to look for other things which initially at first glance are not having to do with the name of this music group? So I could run a corrected spelling of this search, but I look through these results, none of them have anything to do with the group called Centennial Syncopators. Now I'm not surprised because this is not a famous musical group. This is a musical group that was formed by some folks who were friends of my husband's grandfather and they played just locally in the state of Oregon. 
we can improve upon this. And that's what I wanted to kind of help you with today. We're going to improve upon it by just putting a search operator around it. So we're going to do quotation marks around centennial syncopators. And what we just did was we told Google, okay, this is a phrase. Centennial has to come first. Syncopators has to come second. They've got to be together, not in different places on the page. They have to be spelled exactly the way we've spelled them. And they have to be as a phrase on every single search result. This is going to drop your search results initially about 90%. But when I just put this simple operator around it, the very first result is the name of my husband's grandfather, Sidney Mansfield in the Statesman Journal newspaper in Salem, Oregon from 1940. So this is a huge win, and it's going to make a big difference. Don't let this new message from Google throw you off track and make you think there isn't something out there. Clearly there was. I clicked through on Sydney Mansfield, and I find this image. So a lot of times I'll look at the initial websites, and I love looking at the images because it's a nice, quick visual view of your search results. And the very first one is this one. The syncopators will play for cooking school audience. And it not only talks about the band and their performance, but as you can see in my newly colorized photo, which I did over at My Heritage, it names everybody in this photograph. I did not have that until just when I put this together for you a day or so ago. I now not only know that Sydney is in the back row on the right hand side with the violin bow but I know the names of the other people in his band. So that's a pretty exciting thing when it comes to Google search. Just know that you can really make some improvements. Don't take that message that you get from Google totally literally. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds you new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Or have you already taken a DNA test with another service? You can upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad But more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter from my Right, here in the mailbox segment, uh, I want to share with you that email from Tim. He wrote a little while back and he says, I'm getting back into genealogy in a meaningful way now that my dissertation is done and I realize that I don't know what to do with all the stuff I've taken photos of, picked up at yard sales, etc. That could be of genealogical value to someone, but not me. I've got yearbooks, pictures of the genealogy information inside family Bibles, etc., I used to be able to scan and submit to Macavo for the world to use, but that's gone. With the Roots Web mailing list shutting down, do you have any recommendations for where I can submit these things so that they benefit others? Well, Tim, in fact, I do have a few recommendations. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, this is a question I get pretty often. And I, and I guess it's makes sense because, you know, as we go about our own 
uh, travels and activities doing our own genealogy research, it's just inevitable that you run across other people's family history. So here are a couple of ideas for you. So these days, really a free website, and more specifically, a blog, is your own genealogy bulletin board with a much greater reach than Roots Web ever had. I mean, really, because when you have your own website or your own genealogy blog, even if the, you've just posted a couple things, it does not have to be something that you keep up or write on a regular basis. That is out there on the web. Google is going to index it, and it's going to pop up in search results when people are online looking for information. Roots Web really catered to a genealogy audience, but it's very likely that people who are not typically into genealogy might get a bee in their bonnet and search for something or be looking for something or think of something, and they'll do a quick Google search, and there you will be. It's a great way to get the word out. So a free blog that you can use, which I've talked about here uh, on the podcast before, is blogger.com. That's Google's free blogging platform. It's a really good choice. Of course, it's built in a way that Google search likes it because it's obviously the same company. And it's really easy to use. In fact, I've got some older video tutorials um, on the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, again, youtube.com slash genealogy gems. It's all about how to set up a blogger blog for free. It's, It's a short series. There's a couple of different episodes that you can watch. And these videos are a companion to episodes 37 through 40 of my free podcast, Family History, Genealogy Made Easy. Now, if that doesn't ring a bell to you, if you're new to Genealogy Gems, that was a podcast I did several years ago. Um, But there's still a lot of great content in there. And it's kind of a just kind of an easygoing family history 101 kind of thing. It's still in all the major podcasting apps. And of course, we have a link to it under podcast in the menu at genealogygems.com. And really creating your own blog was such a big topic that we actually covered it in three different episodes, 37 through 40. So those are available absolutely for free. You can take a listen. And I will have links in the show notes for this episode over to the podcast episodes, over to those free quick little video tutorials on YouTube to help you get started right away. As I mentioned, it's not that you have to become a genealogy blogger. You could really just post one or two articles kind of featuring what it is that you have. One of the most important things to remember is if you have photographs, you have digital documents that you want to post on your blog, you can do that. Works great for that. But be sure to include as much detail as you can in text form, right? Because when people do their Google searching, they're going to be searching using words. And Google can't necessarily look at your picture, understand and interpret the picture or the image. So it's relying on the text that you add to that image on the blog post. Basically, it's a website article. It's relying on that to be able to figure out, oh, this is exactly what this other person is Googling for. I'll give them this page as a search result. So you want to make sure that your stuff gets found. And uh, the nice thing is, of course, there's a comment feature on blogs. So at the bottom of the blog post where you talk about the item and let people know, hey, reach out to me, leave a comment below if you're interested in this item and you can um, tell me how this relates to your family. We've talked about some of the wonderful examples here on the show of people who've made connections just through that little commenting feature. Also, there is an about section where you can kind of talk about you, who you are and why you've got this blog out there. And you can also put your email address there so that people can get in touch with you and you will have a wonderful vehicle for getting those items, potentially back to the descendants of other families. It's an amazing way to help other families and get stuff out of your house. (laughs) What could be better? We're all kind of in spring cleaning mode right now. So that works out great. So remember, you don't have to do anything fancy. I would create a separate blog post for each item, particularly if they are not part of the same family. Blog posts don't have to be any particular length, so they can be 
short and sweet. They can have a picture and the text paragraph kind of explaining what it is and how to get in touch with you. I would add tags and Blogger will give you an opportunity to attach tags, which are basically just words, um, individual words that are most important to what you're talking about. Those kinds of words would be the surname of the family that this item belonged to, um, particular locations, a county name, a town name. Be sure if you put the town name that you include the county and the state. It's amazing how many people feel like, oh, everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about, and they don't specify. And so many names, of course, are towns in many different states or different countries. So you want to make sure that you give them a specific location. And also, I would make a tag for the type of item. So you could say family Bible, um, census records, whatever it is that you have. You could also have records as tag words. Include lots of names, any information that you have. Type it up in text. That's names, dates, places. That's the stuff that people are going to be looking for. They're going to be Googling for, and it's going to help your blog post pop up. Now, there's another way that you can do this as well. If you don't want to take that on or spend that time doing that, um, and depending on the kinds of items that you have, particularly for items that might be physical items, like if you uh, picked up a tintype from another family at at an antique store or an item or something, you know, that's physical, that can be a little tougher. You can take a picture of it and put it on the blog. But there's now a Facebook group that you can reach out to that can help you with the process of returning those items back to the people who descend from those families. If you've ever wondered if you'll ever find that lost photograph or an old family Bible, or maybe it's your great grandmother's bronzed baby shoes, Carol Kid Osborne and her Facebook group may just help you make it happen. The group is called From Shrubs to Trees a pay it forward genealogy group. And here to tell us more about it is Carol. Hi, Carol. Hello. Uh, With you. I'm so happy you're here with us. You're in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm out here in Texas. And we actually managed to get on the same time frame (laughs) with time zones. I'm looking forward to talking to you this because I think you watched one of the Elevens is with Lisa shows, I think, and reached out to me, right? Yes, I did. I did. Um, This is such a a thing that's near and dear to my heart, and I hope more people get involved with doing this type of pay it forward kind of thing. Yeah, well, I'd love, let's dig into it because I want people to know what you're doing, how they can find you, and maybe how they could even get involved. Tell us, um, I kind of alluded to it, you're kind of um, reuniting items with families, but tell us what is the goal and the purpose of your Facebook group? Well, the goal and the purpose is just to get, you know, that lost memorabilia back to, if not a direct descendant, you know, at least as close as that we can get to a direct descendant. So, you know, we we have a good number of people that are like-minded that love doing this on the side. <laughs> awesome. And so what prompted you to start it? There must have been some impetus to all this. You know, my husband and I love to go antiquing, and years ago, I went into an antique store and saw a photo that had somebody's name on the back, and you know, I like to say I just can't leave somebody else's family sitting in an antique store, so yeah. it came home with me, and I started the research and was able to, you know, pin somebody down and get a hold of them, and they were just thrilled, thrilled to get it, so that that was kind of the the beginning of it. And ever since then, that's the first thing I head to in an antique store. So look for pictures. Oh, I love antiquing. And and a lot of times, you know, these items don't have a name on them. Do you look for and pick up interesting items that maybe don't have initial identification, but you feel like there's an opportunity there? Sometimes. Now, typically, I don't because it's just incredibly hard to track, you know, that down. Unless it seems to be something that's absolutely amazing. You know, I'll pick it up. I, I picked up a huge photo album uh, at one trip up to Montana, and it did have photos in it. And 99% of them did not have names on them. Wow. 
but I just couldn't let it go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and why not, you know, go for the ones that have those initial clues so that, you know, you can maybe make some more yeah. progress on that. Yeah. I'm curious, do people ever submit items to you? Uh, I know I've even received boxes from listeners of stuff that I remember one woman uh, passed away in a nursing home and she really didn't have any family and her best friend just sent it to me and said, I just want to send it to you just in case. Yeah, they do that on Facebook. Um, if anybody runs across something or some of them have had them for years sitting in boxes mm -hmm. and just didn't know what to do. So they will put those on and we as a collaborative group will go for it, dig in and see if we can't find somebody. And we've had really good luck with that. So uh, how are people joining your group? What's the criteria? And do you know them all? Or have you all kind of gotten to know each other just by being on Facebook together? No, it's all Facebook family people. Um, you know, usually what I'll do is I will, uh, if I see something in another group where somebody might say, hey, I have this, I don't know what to do. I'll let them know that, you know, we have this group. It's, you know, we give it a give, we gift that to the families, and they'll join. And I just have like one really quite good question. That's it. Are you involved in genealogy? Just because we have a love and want to see that step go to somebody, you know, that's that's in the genealogy field most of the time because we know they'll take care of things. Right. <laughs> exactly. So. Um... When you first get an item, you probably have a, a basic research process. Where do you begin, and does it vary a lot by item? It just really does depend. Now, I myself will go pretty much straight to Ancestry and start digging in there. So, you know, if we can, we've got a good name, usually we can find people. Now, granted, there has been one or two instances where the items are not that old, from the 60s, let's say. And sometimes I will search on Facebook to see if I can find them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times I will go to, like, the white pages or, you know, those type of websites to see if I can find a name or an address. Uh, one in particular was a lady that's probably my age that her baby picture was floating around out there. Mm -hmm. And... I was able to track her down within 30 minutes and get it back to her. It just wow, quite amazing. That was probably the quickest one I've ever done. <laughs> she was thrilled, of course. <laughs> now, I remember one time I picked up a photo album, and it was at a garage sale, and I did some research, and I found somebody locally who had it, and I contacted them, and they said, yeah, I don't want it. That's why I got rid of it. Do you ever yeah. get that kind of a response? We have. Not, yeah. not too often, but we have had that. And my best advice is just go down to the next person in line. You know, sometimes you, we do. And people are always amazed that somebody doesn't want that family heirloom or, mm -hmm. you know. But, yes, we, we, try to, we try to get it to somebody. You know, it might not be direct. It might go out a couple generations, but... Uh, yeah, we have had that problem before. And it's sad, but yeah. some people that just don't think like the rest of us <laughs> hold on to that stuff. So. Well, and I imagine when you find people in online family trees, of course, you're finding somebody who's put yeah. the tree there because they're interested. And, you know, if they're looking for family, then they're yeah. probably very interested. Um, I'm interested to hear one of your favorite success stories inspire well, us with all this. This happened a few years ago, and it was just... I mean, it just gives me goosebumps. I had purchased some letters that were written in the 1950s from a soldier to his fiance. And in reading, you know, I kind of read through and it kind of feels a little strange to, you know, kind of take a little snippet out of their life. Yeah. But I was able to find that they had gotten married. I found their daughter. And they were clear back in Pennsylvania. And she said, how did those letters ever get out to our area? Well, come to find out, he had passed on. The mother had Alzheimer's. So when I sent them, she sent me a letter back saying, I cannot thank you enough for giving mother back a part of her history because she didn't remember, you know, so they would be the letters. And so that one to me was just, 
uh, you know, it just goes right to the heart. But that's probably my, my favorite one of all. Well, and it, it's exciting when you can find an activity that you love to do personally, but also is really making a difference in the lives of other people. I mean, you're probably reaching people in that family, even possibly for generations to come and not even knowing who they are. Yeah, when you read something like that, you just kind of burst into tears because yeah. it's personal yeah. you know, and meaningful. So we, we like that. That's fantastic. <laughs> What's your success rate? How is it going Curious, kind of maybe what kind of volume of things are you working on at any given time? Uh, I would say, well, our our success rate we we are not even two years old yet, and we've sent back over sixteen hundred items. Wow! So I think you know we've done a fantastic job. Uh, volume wise, I mean, I usually it, it kind of comes in spurts. You know, we have a big flurry, and then it kind of gets a little quiet for a bit, but um, I don't know. I would say maybe we get three or four a week that come in that post their photos and we sit down and help them with it. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so, I'm just so thankful and proud that we've been able to do that. Now, are most of the things that are getting posted where people are saying, okay, folks, here's what I found. What do you think? Um, are those other researchers in the group? Because I know you're in a sense a closed group. You have to join the group. So if somebody had an item, but they're not currently working to help you identify them, and they're not necessarily looking to do that, can they still somehow contact you or get the item oh, to you? Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I, you know, I have a, a, a email address they can email me at or a message me over Facebook or, you know, just post the picture and we'll just jump right in and start working at Yes, there are a lot of people that are just there to see if they can find family. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everything is digital, so that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, yes, they they can contact me that way. Even though I work, I will usually get back with them within, you know, 12 hours or so if it it goes that long. (laughs) Great. Good. And we'll we'll put your contact info um, with this interview. What do you do with items when you can't find the family or the descendants? Well, sometimes they just sit there, you know, and at least it's there in case someone comes on, you know, later and are looking. You just never know when somebody's going to pop in there to find something. And sometimes we'll go back to old stuff that's kind of stalled and rework it because information has come over that period of time that we didn't know about to begin with. So that is usually how we we deal with those. Sometimes sometimes they'll sit there for a couple of years yeah. before a beep, something pops up and we can get it sent. Right. I mean, every day something new gets posted on one of these online uh, services or trees or new records. So mm-hmm. there's always hope, right? Yeah, there is always hope. That's what I tell people. Don't give up hope. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, it's Shrubs to Trees, a pay it forward genealogy group on Facebook. You've been hearing from Carol Kid Osborne. And um, Carol, you might get some more people who are interested in maybe helping as well as providing items. Hopefully many more will get reunited. Yes, the more the merrier. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it myself. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter from my home As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree 
in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Are you sure that you have found all the school records that are available for your ancestors? Most of us haven't, and the chances are good that there are still some gems out there waiting to be found. So I've got 10 strategies for you that are going to help you track them down. Now, because the movement for compulsory public education didn't begin until the 1920s, Many people assume that there are very few records to be had for genealogical purposes prior to that time. And the reality really couldn't be further from the truth. Many children attended school much earlier. In fact, it may be surprising to learn that the first public school in what is now the United States opened in the 17th century. On April 23rd of 1635, the first public school was established in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, it was a boys-only public secondary school. It was called the Boston Latin School, and it was led by schoolmaster Philemon Pormont, a Puritan settler. The school was strictly for college preparation and produced well-known graduates, including John Hancock and Samuel Adams. But do you know who its most famous dropout was? Benjamin Franklin. (laughs) The school is still in operation today, though it's in a different location. Thousands of schools serving millions of students have been established in the United States since the inception of the Boston Latin School. And according to 2015 and 2016 data from the National Center for Education Statistics, there are 132,853 K-12 schools in the U.S. This means the chances of there being school records for your ancestors are really good. So, Let's get to our 10 top strategies for finding school records. Strategy number one is to establish a timeline of your ancestor's education. So you'll want to check your genealogy software database to figure out when your ancestor would have attended high school or college. And keep in mind, as recently as the 1960s, children did not go to kindergarten, but may have started school at about six years old and beginning in the first grade. To keep my research organized, I created a very simple worksheet form in a Word document, and it allows me to identify the right timeframes, locations, and other pertinent information for my research, and I can record my progress along the way. There's a lot of data to corral, so this is really helpful. In the show notes for this episode, I've got a link to these 10 top strategies, and there you will also find under strategy number one, a link to click and download this blank school records worksheet that I put together so that you can use it for your own research. Now, strategy number two is to consult family papers and books for school records, because of course, with genealogy, we always start at home. So you're going to want to go through your old family papers and books looking for things like school photographs, senior calling cards, high school autograph books, uh, look for journals and diaries talking about school activities, fraternity or sorority memorabilia, yearbooks, and a lot more. So recently, I dug through the boxes that I have and my grandmother's cedar chest, and I found several records that I really hadn't paid attention to before. Like there was a report card from uh, her grade school years and grandma's class picture from the seventh grade in 1925 in Chowchilla, California. 
Check out the show notes. She's in the back row on the far right. And her brother is also uh, in the center of the back row of the same photograph, which was interesting because they weren't the same age. (laughs) So uh, her brother was older, but he too was photographed as part of the seventh grade. And of course, I found my grandmother's senior portrait from 1930. Strategy number three is to Google for academic family history. From the professional website of the state archives to the family history site that's just cobbled together by your cousin that you've never met, the potential for finding school records on the vast expanse of the internet is limitless. So Google is the tool to help you locate those websites that include school-related records. Now, since I'm not sure which school my grandmother attended, I start off my search for my grandmother's school with a simple query for the history of schools in the county where she lived. I was pleasantly surprised at the very first search result. It was a newspaper article from the Madeira Tribune, the local newspaper, literally outlining the history of how the schools evolved in that county. It details things like uh, the driving forces behind where the schools were located, uh, when they were founded, and which ones at the time of the article were no longer in existence. Really helpful stuff. So next, I focused my attention on the grade school listed on my grandmother's brother's sixth grade report card that I discovered during my search of family papers. And I googled together the name of the school, the county, and the state. A search like this can literally deliver millions of results. In fact, this specific search brought up over a million results. But you can typically reduce the unwanted search results that you get by at least 90% if you use search operators. So again, search operators are the symbols and the words that you add to your search that give Google further instructions on what you want done with the words that you're searching. Now I cover a large number of operators in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. The third edition just came out this year in 2020. But I just used one of the most popular search operators to dramatically improve my search for the Sharon school that my grandmother attended. So in this example, I put quotation marks around the name of the school. So Sharon school in quotation marks. And then I had Madera County in California. Doing this explains to Google that I don't just want the word Sharon and the word school in any, you know, mixed up order. I actually want this phrase to appear exactly as I typed it in every single search result that I get. And it has to be spelled exactly the way I spelled it. So you've probably noticed that when you search for a phrase just by itself, you'll receive results that include only one of the words or the words spelled differently or in a different order. The quotation mark search operator prevents all that from happening. It mandates that the phrase appears on every result exactly as you typed it. It's really handy and it makes a huge difference in the volume of search results that you're going to get. Now I didn't put quotation marks around the county name or the state and that's because I recommend using search operators sparingly at least in your initial search and you want to do that just to make sure that you don't miss out on some really good search results. If I were to put quotation marks around Madera County I would not receive any web pages that do mention Sharon School, but just don't happen to mention Madera County as a phrase. So you can see that sometimes overuse of operators can actually cut out really good search results. Focus on what's most important to you in the search that you're running. So what was the difference in the two searches that I ran in terms of the number of results? Well, When I did the quotation marks around Sharon's school, I got just over 11,000 results. That's a fraction, a very small fraction of what I had received when I didn't use the quotation marks. Even more important than that really big reduction is that the results that I got on the first few pages are actually really good matches for what I was looking for. And I could try some other variations as well, such as adding words like history, genealogy, or records. Strategy number four is to search for newspapers, because historic newspapers are also a wonderful source of school honor rolls, 
um, school sporting events and anything else having to do with school life. And while there are certainly more historic newspapers online than there ever have been before, it's still just a fraction of what was actually published. But of course, you first want to find what you can online and preferably that you can access for free and then just kind of move out from there. So a visit to the Chronicle in America website here in the U.S. can help a lot for U.S. research. At the home page, you click the button. It's kind of a purple color button, kind of pinky purple. And it says U.S. Newspaper Directory button. And on the directory search page, then you can enter the state, the county, and the town. So see, I didn't run an initial search right there at the Chronicle in America website. We're actually going to go into the directory first to find out what is listed in the overall directory, whether or not those pages have been digitized. And that way we really get the big picture. So I entered the state, the county, and the town. On the search results page, uh, when you find a newspaper that you want, then scroll down to the bottom of it, of the listing, and you can click view complete holding information. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna show you all the known available locations for that particular newspaper. And believe you me, even a newspaper that's in, you know, Chowchilla, California, may also be held in a completely different location. Um, it could be across the country in a different archive or, or a library. Sometimes there isn't a lot of rhyme or reason why a particular repository holds a collection, but you're going to want to know uh, which ones are available and which ones are closest to you. Now, in my case, the Chowchilla newspaper that I found had not been digitized yet, and it's, so it's not available online. However, the California State Archives in Sacramento has an extensive collection of microfilm. So I was able to make a trip in person, and I was really glad that I did. They not only had the newspaper that I needed, but they had countless other resources that were really helpful for my genealogical research. If you have never been to a state archives, that needs to be on your bucket list because they are just amazing treasure troves. In the show notes, I'll have links to some of the wonderful items that I found. So here are a few more ideas about finding additional resources that are going to help you with your newspaper research. Local newspapers can also be found by searching for the public library website in the town where your ancestor attended school. So check the library's online card catalog or contact them directly to see which newspapers they have and whether they're on microfilm, whether they can be loaned out via interlibrary loan. You'll also want to check some of the major newspaper websites like newspapers.com by Ancestry. It's a subscription website, of course, but it's got over 14,900 newspapers uh, spanning from the 1700s to the 2000s, and millions of additional pages are added every month. So if you can't find what you need that's on the free sites, before you make a trip, you want to go and check those subscription websites and see if by chance they have them. And you don't have to have a paid subscription in order to check and see, do they have the newspaper titles that you need? Genealogy Bank is another one of those genealogy newspaper websites. They also offer a seven-day free trial. And it's a very popular site. It's got over 11,000 newspapers, 95% of which Genealogy Bank says are exclusive to their website. And that brings up a good point. Many of the websites have some of the same newspapers. So I try to kind of have a a wish list of the different kinds of papers I'm looking for. And they may not be in the same family research, but if I know that two websites both have the paper that I'm looking for, I want to lean towards getting a subscription with the site that has the largest number of the newspapers that I have on my wish list. And of course, I wrote a book on newspaper research, how to find your family history in newspapers. And it has a whole search methodology uh, to help you with your newspaper research. So there's a link to that in the show notes as well. It's available in the Genealogy Gems store. Strategy number five is con to consult U.S. state archives and libraries. And we mentioned state archives before because I happened to end up there in the research on my grandmother's school. And as I said, public libraries and state archives are just a treasure trove in general, and they also oftentimes have school-related records. 
Now, while it's easy to stop by your local library just to do, run a search, it may not be as easy to make your way to the public library in the town where your ancestors lived. But you can turn to the internet to do your homework regarding the repositories, the holdings, and most convenient and economical ways to access them. Simple Google searching on the locality and whether you put in the public library or the state archive, get to their website, get all that information to plan how you're going to get access. And a great place to start also, in addition to just Googling, is the worldcat.org website. At worldcat.org, that's kind of a a global uh, library card catalog, if you will. It's a great place to start, and you can just start out by conducting a general search. And once you find an item that interests you, you can then enter your zip code under find a copy in the library section, and it's going to tell you again where you can get your hands on that particular item. The names of the libraries are typically hyperlinked, so usually you can just click through and go straight to their website. And again, WorldCat is an international resource, so even if you live outside the U.S., it's definitely worth taking a look and combing through that catalog. Strategy number six is to contact your state historical and genealogical society. And that's because they can have things like old yearbooks, uh, photograph collections, or just filing cabinets full of of various records and, and histories on the schools in the area. For example, the Ohio Genealogical Society Library has a large collection of Ohio school yearbooks. Local historical and genealogical societies also may have school memorabilia in their archive collections. To find contact information for a local society, just Google the name of the county and state and add the words, of course, genealogy, history, or society at the end. So I could do a search on dark county genealogy society. Very simple. It'll get you straight there and it's likely to be the first result that you get. Strategy number seven search for online yearbooks. One of the most exciting genealogical record collections to have come out in recent times is Ancestry.com's U.S. School Yearbooks 1900 through 1999 collection. It's an indexed collection of middle school, junior high, high school, and college yearbooks from across the U.S. In June of last year, 2019, Ancestry replaced old records with new updated records for most of the yearbooks found on the site. And they also added new records from 150,000 yearbooks that previously only had images available. Later, in August of 2019, they improved that collection even further by adding a staggering 3.8 million new records. And this update also included 30,000 new image-only books. Ancestry also has an extensive index collection of middle school, junior high, high school, and college yearbooks for Canada. So I'll have a link to that as well in the show notes. MyHeritage.com also has a great yearbook collection. And you may have heard, I talked about it in my Elevens is with Lisa show uh, about a week or so ago. They've actually run their yearbooks through their colorization tool. As I talked about in the last premium episode, it was um, premium podcast 182. I was talking about the idea of running documents, maybe hard to read documents through my heritage's colorization tool in order to maybe provide more clarity, make them a little easier to read, see them in a different light, if you will. Well, the next day after I published that, my heritage came out and said, hey, we've run our yearbooks through colorization. So it's definitely a strategy worth looking at. I took a look at some of those and it's it's really fun to see what previously black and white photos from yearbooks, which of course the yearbooks are chock full of photographs and to see them in color is just uh, really neat. So take a look at the My Heritage yearbooks as well. It's a great collection. There's also other websites out there that you can find that feature yearbooks like old-yearbooks.com which according to their website, it says oldyearbooks.com is a free genealogy site displaying old yearbooks, class rosters, alumni lists, school photos, and related school items. All material on the site is the property of the submitter. You may not use the images, text, or materials 
elsewhere, whether in print or electronically, without permission from the submitter. So keep that in mind when you check out that site. And of course, there's also classmates.com, and you can register for free to browse hundreds of thousands of yearbooks. And there you can register for free to browse hundreds of thousands of yearbooks as well. I've even found the rare occasional yearbook over at Google Books. It's worth a quick look because it's absolutely free. For example, I found the yearbook of the Columbia University School of Architecture. A very specific, unique yearbook, but if your ancestor attended there, wow, there it is for free. And you can look through the entire book and even download it. Strategy number eight is to check township archives. Now, you might be thinking that you didn't hear that right, but you really did. Townships are small areas within a county, and these small townships might have their own archives or just a little one-room museum. They are often the holders of some pretty one-of-a-kind finds. So the best way to determine what the township may have been is to contact the township trustees. You can Google the township name, the county name, state name, and add the word trustee. And you'll likely need to give one of these trustees a phone call to ask what resources that they might have available. Strategy number nine is to search eBay auctions. Of course, eBay.com is an auction website. I've been talking about eBay and family history since I started this podcast. And it's really the perfect place to look for school records and memorabilia, particularly really hard to find yearbooks. You can conduct a search on the school or the town that you're looking for to see if anybody is out there selling a yearbook that you want. And you'll need, of course, a free eBay account to do that. Also, you can search for old photographs or postcards of the school building that you can add to your family history as well. When I searched for Chowchilla, California School, several auctions for school-related items from my grandmother's high school came right up. Unfortunately, these are auctions for yearbooks after she'd already graduated, but no problem. It means they're out there. So this search is only for today, right? It's the day that I ran it. Tomorrow, somebody could put up an auction for exactly the year that I need. But of course, the problem is nobody has enough time to search eBay every day. But you don't have to because you can save your search and eBay will search for that item every day for you. So all you have to do is just run the initial search and then you'll see a button that says save this search towards the top of the page. You just click that and then eBay will send you an email anytime it finds a new auction that comes up that meets your search criteria. It's fantastic. It's going to save you so much time and it's pretty exciting when one of those emails just pops in your inbox. You can learn more about setting up eBay save searches Uh, for family history by listening to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 140. And here's one of my other favorite strategies. After you run your initial search, check the box on the results page to include completed listings. So these are auctions that are already done. They've already finished. In the revised completed search results, you might see some items that fit what you're looking for. And if the item has a green price, it means the item was sold. If the price is black, it didn't sell. Each item will also have a link that says view similar active items. So you can click that to see a list of items currently for sale that are very similar to the one that you wanted. So this means you can contact the seller of any item to require about the unsold item or you can ask whether they have related items as well. Now I've talked about before in the podcast, uh, my husband's grandfather, Raymond, he was a music teacher for years in McMinnville, Oregon. So I've actually turned to eBay and found several old yearbooks from the 1940s that show him on the faculty, show him in photographs with his students. So he was a teacher and I'm finding him in old school records, but certainly, um, It's a wonderful place to look for any yearbook that you're trying to get your hands on. And my final strategy, number 10, is to call the school. If the school's still in operation, you can just try calling the main office or the administrative office. And they may have 
old yearbooks and scrapbooks in their library or on display. And if they don't, they may very well be able to tell you where they can be found. You can also obtain contact information by, of course, Googling the name of the school and the location. And keep in mind, good time is to try calling a school our mid-morning after schools are settled at the class or between 3 and 4 p.m., of course, uh, when many of the kids have gone home from school. But the office is still open. So there you have it. Those are my 10 strategies for finding school records. Of course, head to the show notes for links to all the different resources that I mentioned. And of course, that free worksheet that you can download. And I'd love to have you also send me a note. Have you found school records in a really unusual place? Do you have additional strategies that we can add to the list? You can email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 241. You can find the show notes for this episode at genealogygems.com. And under podcast, click Genealogy Gems podcast, and then look for the link for number 241. And of course, if you have any questions or comments for me, email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or leave me a voicemail on the voicemail line 925 925- Two seven two four zero two one. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.